John Drummond here to tell you about this week's TNT show, 7pm on August the 19th. The Nation talks to Grouse Peter, renowned television and stage producer, and so much more besides. Don't miss it, 7pm Wednesday. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present music and musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The musings, well, they're thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, I'm Fiona from Clackman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? It goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio.
Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a program out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a standby. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. Everyone, John Drummond here to tell you about this week's TNT show, 7pm on August the 19th. The Nation talks to Grouse Peter, renowned television and stage producer, and so much more besides. Don't miss it, 7pm Wednesday. You can still hear me, John. Hi, good evening. Welcome, everyone, to the TNT Show. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. You may have seen today's polls uh, for the independence movement and for the SNP. They're terribly, terribly encouraging. Uh, support for independence, I guess, is at an all-time high, of, if not very close to it. And SNP support is uh, very high, rising too. So... To no one's surprise, Scottish Labour chooses today to announce its total and utter opposition to a referendum on independence. My word, superb timing. Hi, I'm John Drummond and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Thanks for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest. I know I say that every week, but it's true every week. We have another great guest tonight and I'm really excited that he's here with us. Stay tuned to hear about being a theatre and movie producer, as well as being a hit on social media. And Gareth is taking your questions live. But first, a few words about TNT. The Nation Talks. The Nation Talks, your show. It's really about your questions. Don't hesitate. If you have a question for Gareth or for me or for anyone else on the live, the details are on the screen. Let us know what you would like to talk about. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Now to our guest. Tonight, The Nation talks to Gareth Wardell, better known to some of you as Grouse Peter. How are you, Gareth? How are you and the family coping with the pandemic? Oh, the pandemic. Um, that's got panic in it, hasn't it, that word? Um, well, uh, luckily, both my wife and I are freelancers, so we work from home, so lockdown didn't really trouble us all that much. Um, managed to get down to the shops to get produce. Plus, I've been trying to build this garden in which I've got a few raised beds built where we could plant the vegetables. 
So we've survived reasonably well, uh, not fallen out, uh, moments of short temper, <laughs> and then you get close quarters with another human being that irritates the hell out of you. Yeah, so, I'm speaking for the whole of Scotland when you say that. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, yeah, uh, surviving uh, reasonably well. Uh, although yeah, that's, that's uh, good the weather's news. been good and the weather's been atrocious. And I hear it's going to be atrocious again tomorrow. So I got that. that that's why tonight's show is so important for people to get a sense of joy and, 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 and et cetera. So tell us a little bit about your background, because you've got a, a very interesting background, Gareth. <laughs> um, don't let the bourgeois appearance fool you. I'm from a broken home. Uh, my uh, grandparents were um, uh, highly uh, uh, proficient musicians, uh, pioneering musicians. Grandfather um, set up the Musicians' Union in Scotland. Um, uh, uh, my mother, my, I'm half Sicilian. My mother is uh, 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 Irish. Scottish, she was uh, born here. Uh, my grandfather uh, was Irish from County Mayo. Um, unfortunately, my mother uh, uh, married uh, a guy that she wasn't really uh, in tune with after uh, Churchill sent my father back home uh, uh, to Italy. And um, things sort of fell apart after that. Uh, he was what you would call the salt of the earth, my stepfather, uh, but um, not in any way uh, uh, artistic or creative, which my mother was, and as I said, the other family was. So I ran away lots of times from home, and eventually uh, one of my mother's sisters started to look after me, my guardian. So if I am... <clears throat> Uh, capable of any kind of uh, uh, caring, love or affection for uh, uh, human beings that came from her. Um, although she was terrible old-fashioned in her day. You know, if any sex scene came on television, uh, the television was switched off instantly, that kind of thing. She was very old-fashioned that way. So, of course, that always made me, when you're young, it always makes you curious. As for the rest of my life, um, <clears throat> Being from, you know, run away from a broken home uh, and a bleak childhood um, automatically it leads lots of young people to go towards the theatre. It's quite an attractive sort of thing where you can dress up and be someone else. But I wanted to direct um, and so went to the Glasgow School of Art. Well, it's a conservatoire now, I think it's called. Uh, I don't know why they called it that, but in my day it was the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. And um, then went into professional theatre um, and uh, got some directing work, worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company a short time. Um, and then for some reason I decided I wanted academic qualifications. So uh, I got uh, teaching and lecturing uh, qualifications uh, distinction. Uh, one of the few times that that word has been attached to my name. Um, and remembered that after I'd done some teaching in uh, Glasgow schools, I noticed that uh, these young people that held this energy, and some of them uh, clearly talented, uh, had nowhere to go. So I did what anyone else would do. I decided that uh, there should be a national theatre for young people aged 18 to about 21 or 22. And I raised the money to get it off the ground and uh, brought in Professor Mulrine, who was head of English at Edinburgh University and brought in Origin people, Equity, the Actors Union, to a big meeting in Glasgow. And then I read my paper, uh, lifted my head up after about, I think it was maybe uh, 50 minutes. I thought we'd be a 10 minute, 10 minute little talk. Uh, telling them why I thought this was important for Scotland, you know, to try and uh, nurture the talent and ability was here. Uh, drama covering everything, mm. music, writing, the technical side, uh, the performance art side. Um, and the head of the School of Drama and Englishman said, well, of course, uh, Gareth's idea of a national 
uh, theatre for new young talents, all very well, but it needs a special person to lead such an institution. And I've never forgotten this moment because I didn't know what to say to that, uh, even though I had the checks from various uh, international trusts to set it up. But uh, Professor Mulrine, who was sitting just above me to my left, looked over to the head of the school, the uh, drama school, and said, Mr. Argent, uh, the mere existence of a paper on the subject presupposes the existence of such a person. And <laughs> I had a terrible mixture of pride and fear. Pride because he made me, but fear because I'd never ever had an intention to run such an institution. I just wanted to see it started. And that's what happened. Um, I went to the pub and started to weep and tell my friends I knew nothing about Scottish history. I'll be cut out first go. Um, and that then led on to seven years working with young people. Uh, most of them are sort of famous now and made lots of money, forgot my telephone number. And then I, I went, I just, when I decided that time would come, I couldn't relate to young people anymore. You know, they were just ego-ridden little pimply, uh, 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 vain human beings. It was time for me maybe to do, go back to adult concerns. And so um, uh, I had a misstep. I got invited by BBC to become head of the youth programmes over in Ireland. Um, I hated what I saw and heard there. Uh, asked to be brought back and work in BBC Scotland, which they allowed me to do, and I disliked that even more. And then one day uh, I had the, the joy of walking into my head of programmes and saying, I'm leaving. He said, what are you going to do? You're married with kids. I said, well, I've just been given two and a half million pounds to make a, a political movie from Channel 4. And so that's a long-winded way of telling you, you know, why you're interviewing me now. Yeah. Um, after that, um, I did what every other ambitious person has done in Scotland. I had to leave Scotland to find work. Uh, yeah. uh, we, uh, you know, we don't make films in Scotland, really. We go to see them. So I went over to Los Angeles and for about 10 months in each year, but I didn't leave my house in Scotland. Uh, but it was, it was a good time and it was a difficult time. And then I came back in 2013 when I knew we were going to have our independence referendum because I thought there's no way I'm going to miss that. Um, and that's me here now, forever, I think. Tell us a little bit more about your family, about your wife and your children. What, what will you do? I'm married to one of Scotland's... Uh, uh, greatest painters and uh, master uh, printmakers, Barbara Ray, Dr. Barbara Ray, uh, who's a royal academician, uh, a royal everything, etcher, <laughs> where you name it, goes off the end of the envelope. In fact, I, she's so famous, I have to walk behind her like the Duke of Edinburgh. <laughs> and you, you might think that, you might think that that's an absolute nonsense, but it's absolutely true. Um, she is considered by uh, some of the world's top painters as a great colorist. Um, and she is a woman who refuses to be called a female artist. She says, don't demean me. I am a painter and an artist. Uh, the female is redundant. Yeah. Yeah. So that's her. Uh, one daughter uh, runs a very successful Montessori school, art school, uh, where young people discover uh, solutions to problems and uh, how to how to and themselves through the arts. You know, ex self exploration. Yeah. And the other one, the youngest one, who looks hundred percent Italian, <laughs> uh, she's six feet tall, Nora, uh, who played Mary Queen of Scots in the London production, uh, and now a theatre director. She's a chip of the old block, um, and she's down there now, but she hopes to get back to give her dad uh, a good squeeze and a hug. Um, good. Uh, 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 I hope not asking me for any more money. <laughs> until, until I can sell something else that I've written. 
Uh, that's really it. Uh, my, my, I come from a musical side of the family, but I, I, I can't play music. I can, I can recognize a composer in two bars. Yeah. Even if it's a piece of his music uh, or her music I've never heard before. Uh, I can't um, read music. And uh, my grandfather stuck a fiddle in my hand when I was about five and whipped it out again. I said, the boy, it will not be musical, but his creativity will come out some other way. In fact, when I was at school, or when I was at uh, first year in secondary school, my report said, uh, Gareth Wardell is um, uh, uh, a chap who uh, uh, his mind wanders that on all occasions and all classes, he has imagination which should be curbed at all costs. So I got <laughs> that one down. But I was top in my primary school. Um, and the teacher said, uh, all right, Gareth, you've come top, so final year in primary school. What book would you like? Um, how about uh, the Bino Annual? Or um, <laughs> she went through these comic book things. I said, no, I would like, um, I would like the, the novel Moby Dick. <laughs> she said, but the, Moby Dick, she said, but there, there's, there's no illustrations in that. I said, don't mind, miss, I just love the story. <laughs> so it was all there. Yeah. And at secondary school, um, I didn't do very well. You know, when you come from a broken home and you lack confidence, um, which I did, as well as many others, um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to feel that even if you're good at something, it'll take you somewhere. I was asked by the woodwork teacher, what do you want to do? I said, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd like to go to university. You have to be intelligent to go to university, Gareth. <laughs> Well, yeah, I suppose so, sir. I suppose you're right. Years later, I saw him at the top of Leaf Walk walking down, you know, and you, your ego says, I'm going to tell that son of a, you know, exactly. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind, you know, for undermining my confidence. But there was just this wee, humpy back guy, you know, all this color together. Yeah. And I thought, no, just, just let him walk past. Yeah. Uh, I also met my, um, uh, I don't know if you want to hear this. Uh, uh, Anecdote, but I'll tell you, I met my primary teacher uh, years later. Um, now, you've got to, you and your viewers have got to try and imagine that I have dark hair and long, dark beard. Uh, no problem. And when I was outside the school, children were nudging each other at the bus stop and I knew they were trying to ask me something. No, you, you ask them, no, you ask them. So I said, What is it you want to ask me? And this child said, um, Sir. Do you know you look like Jesus? And the uh, most beautiful thing anyone has ever said to me. Now, I realize I look like the Turin Shroud, but you have to try and imagine that um, I looked like Jesus when I met my primary teacher and her daughter walking towards me. And I shifted on the pavement to let them pass, and she stopped in front of me. She said, I know who you are. I said, I don't understand that we met. I'm your primary teacher. <gasps> this beautiful blonde lady and her daughter was even more beautiful. I said, Miss McDonald. She said, that's me, Gareth. A few more pleasantries. And then she said, I'll tell you a little secret, Gareth. When you came to my class, you always made sure you got a seat and a desk at the front. And I said, why? She said, so you could stare at my legs. <laughs> and you know, she was absolutely right. <laughs> As an adult, I always had an eye for a well-turned heel, you know, a long yeah. life. So there's true stories for you. Used to look like Jesus, now I look like the Turin Shroud, but that's <laughs> actually time. And maybe a touch of Billy Connolly. Uh, oh, God. Um, that's got worse. Uh, I worked with Billy, you know, in, a, in a, an Amnesty International charity show, which I produced at the Usher Hall during the festival. He was the last guest. And afterwards, when I was taking my gift of a framed uh, version of the poster for the show, I caught him staring at me down the hall. I mean, really staring at me. And I knew immediately what he was thinking. I said, I used to be dark haired, Billy. And it happened, it happened recently. Uh, it was in an open top car, dark glasses on, on the slope around the Bank of Scotland and the mound going downhill. And the lights sort of red. You know, that way you get to Waverley, that way you go down to the mound, to the, the, um, the, the academy. Yeah, and there was a, 
a bar on my left with people sitting outside, and I heard, Billy, Billy, I'm over here, Billy. <laughs> and I said, Rain, change the lights. God, I'll believe in you if you change those right lights from red to green. And <laughs> she kept shouting, as good. And I, I just kept the dark shades, and I turned slowly and said, I'm on my holidays, Mag, he's a brick. <laughs> she, she burst out laughing. So I've had that a few times, even when I was in hospital recently. The next door neighbor in the bed said, Has anyone ever told you you look like Billy Conley? Uh, no, never. How are you feeling? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll come back to your story in a second. We've had a question. Uh, and we can come back, to this, come back to this from butterla- Butterflies Rising on Periscope. And the question is What's the most important thing we should prioritize in an independent Scotland? So that, right, that's presuming that we, we have independence. Of course. Uh, right. What should we prioritise? Uh, that's, really, uh, that's a really complicated question. Uh, I would have thought the kind of society that we need to build, ethics, morals, an open society, look at our justice system, uh, look at our education system and see if we can be a bit more radical in the way we uh, teach young children. Uh, so uh, I know that sounds a bit Presbyterian, but uh, you know, well, if you're Scots, the Presbyterianism squats on your shoulder like a frog, you know, like a toad. You can never get rid of it. But um, I, it would have to be how we want to treat each other and um, what kind of inclusive society we should be forming. Yeah. Um, at the moment, uh, I sometimes get the impression that um, some people want it to be exclusive, uh, but that's a different story. So, yeah, morals, ethics, and indeed, what is it that we have to do to uh, create opportunity for happiness? Yeah. Happiness is one of the least in my view, one of the least uh, thought about uh, attributes for human nature. Yeah. And a democrat, you know, democracy isn't about making everybody equal. It's about offering equal opportunity. Uh, um, I know you've heard that before. But what I mean by that is uh, not everybody can be equal. Uh, there are some people who are not ambitious and don't want it. There are some people by their predicament. Um, uh, who are disadvantaged yeah. in some way. Um, and there's probably a tiny percentage who you can never actually uh, uh, cope with in a dem- in democracy. So nobody should think that overnight there's some kind of nirvana. You know what? The, our, our opponents uh, keep telling us, oh, you're talking about heaven on earth. That won't ever happen. Well, no, nobody's talking about heaven on earth. But democracy... It, can, it, it is a system which does its best to provide the best uh, for the majority. And it's up to governments to try and uh, spread that across all societies and uh, all cliques. Yeah. And so, yeah, happiness would be, uh, would be one of my priorities. That's, that's very profound, if you don't mind me saying so. Um. I know you, uh, you have a terminal condition, Gareth. Would you like to talk about that? Is that you mean something? intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my terminal condition. <laughs> well, um, nature gave me um, everything. Um, uh, and perhaps it's that, as it is with mongrel dogs, uh, they don't get the same ailments as the pure breeds. So I'm half and half, and I've had remarkable health. Um, and uh, if the um, sun comes out for five minutes, my skin tones dark brown immediately. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I used to be able to um, leap over a tall building in a single bound. Or as my wife said when she first met me, run up by this hill in front of me and come all the way back down again. You weren't even out of breath. <laughs> I thought, yeah, you just wanted me to go for your shopping. (laughs) So um, 
it was a bit of a shock to discover not only did uh, to discover recently not only did I have cancer it was a rare and incurable form see I'm that kind of special person that uh, I get blessed with that and uh, the uh, the cancer is a virus it stays in your body so no matter which bits they cut out when you find it it just waits the virus hangs around and waits till your immune system lowers so there we are tall swimmer shoulders strong lungs not a smoker <laughs> can yeah. run up huge hills rising back again without being out of breath to impress the woman that he was in love with um, and uh, the Cancer is the tiniest thing you've ever seen. It's um, like a pearl of tapioca with a little black dot on the top. Uh, um, so my time is limited. Um, as I said in an essay recently, uh, for this is not too morbid, uh, we're all dying in one way or another. You know, we start small, we start tiny, we grow big, we procreate, and then we get small again, <laughs> get tiny. <laughs> It's a bit of a circular existence, uh, but that's the way of it. And um, that damn cancer will just wait and uh, strike. My grandfather, uh, Patrick Riley, uh, uh, he died at 84, and that was even after a handsome cab had run over his stomach when he was in his mid-30s, you know. And as you get older, the wound opens up again. It, it troubles you at later life because you become overweight. Yeah. Not got enough exercise. Um, and my mother, God bless her, um, who never ate a damn thing, um, as thin as a, a stick of cel celery, and a chain smoker, died only a few years ago at 92. Yep. So I'm a bit disappointed that I am more than likely never to reach my 80s. But uh, uh, I keep using the word but. Mm, the only time it bothers me is when I feel pain and when I wake up in the morning and realize what my condition is. But you know, I've led a terrific life um, so far and still work to do. And uh, there are people out there who are suffering, who are not sitting in front of you and giving uh, an interview, you know, uh, with a nice uh, little glass of uh, Jura. <laughs> I've not been paid for this advert, just to let you know. Incidentally, the, the, the wonderful writer, Clive James, remember him? Who died yes. recently. Mm -hmm. uh, terrific uh, writer. Uh, uh, the, first, the first television critic to tackle sports commentators. You know, the, one, the, the ones who said, and she's using all her energy to swim ahead through the water. And it's, you know, as opposed to swim backwards or sink. Uh, she... Um, he had any number of ailments in the last 10 years of his life, including diabetes. Um, but if you looked at him carefully, he was particularly bald. You would see all the brown patches. And he used to make regular two or three month visits back to his own home country, Australia. So these debilitating illnesses he had didn't kill him. Yeah. A melanoma killed him. Yeah. And my cancer is a melanoma, but it's the one just under the skin not the one on the top it just right. sits quietly on the muscle or on the subcutaneous uh, fat in my case right. underneath the flesh underneath um and uh, you have to get um x-rayed you know a cat scan and if they spot it they'll try and uh, put you under a knife and flick it out until it appears again right, right. um is that all you need to know? Uh, thank you for sharing, as they say, <laughs> in the best Hollywood circles. Well, seriously, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to go back to some of the questions, if I may, because we're getting, we're getting loads of questions, Gareth. Okay. Um, Reg Tate on Facebook asks, how do you see the political structure after independence? Uh, can something be formed that Scots will have confidence in? Political structure, I wonder uh, what you mean. Well, the unionist parties, quite obviously, can't be unionist parties anymore. Uh, one of the few, if not the only country in the world in which we actually pay politicians to preach to us and scorn us and tell us that we should be governed by our neighbour state uh, and we should be like our neighbour state. We, we should emulate them in every way, including our culture. 
Um, so they, they would have to reform themselves uh, into a party that puts Scotland's um, uh, interests first. As for the Scottish National Party, well, it would lose its core reason for existence. And it too would have to reform and rethink. Um, I've had a feeling for the past two or three years that somewhere at a meeting in the SNP, um, the hierarchy with their advisors were told, here's what we should do. Uh, we should show we are fit to govern. Now, that seems to me laudable uh, a noble uh, cause. And uh, uh, to some extent, not all, they've done that. They've certainly shown that they have um, more talent than the opposition parties, which are in complete disarray and ineffectual. Uh, so the SNP would have to rethink what its role is, and find out what it wants to do for Scotland. Yeah. Um, so, it, I don't know, it might come up with some radical uh, policies, which it hitherto has not been able to do whilst under the thumb of Westminster. Yeah. I, I wrote a piece in the uh, Constitution column of the Sunday National addressing that point uh, last week, because it seems to me the smart people in both the Labour the party and also the Conservatives, uh, are bound to be seriously considering uh, a split because the reality is that uh, whoever splits early, uh, for example, in the Conservative and Unionist Party and discards the Unionists and said, we're just plain Conservatives and we will be standing in an independent Scotland as the Scottish Conservative Party with no Unionist affiliations of, of, of any kind. Yes. Uh, would still a march on the other right-wing parties that might emerge after independence. If they leave it too late, then uh, fate will be very unkind to them. And that must be, there must be an equivalent bunch of group in the Labour Party saying, we have to break ranks soon, because if we leave it too late, what will happen is that as the SNP perhaps changes after independence, uh, Labour and Conservative parties will be created, and we'll have none of that because we'll have no uh, credibility. Well, the, 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 the politicians of <laughs> unionist parties uh, are such because uh, their future is down south. It's with yeah. West. Oh, yeah. Um, you might want to call them carpetbaggers. Um, and I see one of them, um, uh, Mr. Tompkins, has decided to uh, follow wherever the money is because it isn't going to be in Scotland. And he's uh, opting out of the uh, Scottish branch of the Tory party. Yeah. So, uh, the sense of it is that, that will probably happen increasingly. I'm sure. Uh, it, it, My wife little... tells me that if she had not, as a, she arrived at art school in Edinburgh, fully formed, no heroes in uh, the art world, admired the great Spanish painters, but she came as a Highland girl, fully formed in what she wanted to do, so this kind of semi abstract um, way that she paints. And in a social political uh, manner, uh, her subject matter tends to be um, uh, where humankind has altered uh, the land or um, an old cottage or a potato famine field in the west yeah. of Ireland, uh, standing stones, you know, or terraces in Spain where the Moors um, uh, and then the Spanish have uh, planted their vines, their yeah. great vines. And she tells me that uh, had she not early on gone to London and got an exhibition immediately, she wouldn't be a Royal Academist yeah. because the people in London would not have noticed that. I never did that. I went to London and hated it. Um, the, uh, the gum and the urine stuck to my soles and my shoes. And uh, I spent uh, three weeks living in the back of a camper van. <laughs> garage that was open at nights. The, the garage over didn't know, and I used the toilet to shave and, and to wash. Uh, at night time, I went into the camper van and pulled the little curtains around the windows. Um, very resourceful. <laughs> so I didn't do that. I went to America. Uh, but she did the right thing, and she's quite correct. 
And these uh, politicians and the parties, they know that their future lies down south. That's where the bread is buttered. So they're just going, and even if they don't believe it, even if it, you know, um, uh, sticks in their craw to uh, belittle Scotland uh, every day they go into the Holyrood uh, chamber, they will still carry on because the OBEs and the airmen and the uh, directorships of the banks and all that, they're all down south. Uh, that's the lure. So even after 1707, they're still taking the bobbies. They're, yeah. they're still uh, accepting the gold. I have to say, having lived in the South for over 20 years, frankly, I don't see much chance of employment for many of them. They're, they're very low quality. No disrespect aimed at anyone in particular, but just from a managerial point of view, uh, I, mean, I, I just couldn't conceive of anyone uh, giving any major credibility to some of the people I see on the opposition benches at Hollywood. Well, uh, that's just my... Richard that's Leonard my giving a, a speech uh, in the Parliament is really like watching a Boy Scout trying to get his oh, first badge. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pitiful. Yeah. Uh, but that's the people... You see, that's the insult to Scotland. That's the people, the parties in London, put up here. They're not going to squander their best talent. They're going to send us, you know, the, the subs... <laughs> That's the one they're going to send up here. So, um, uh, but, don't, but don't you think, though, Gareth? I mean, speaking plainly, that if you feel the subs, you should expect to get gubbed because that's essentially what happens. And it, it seems to be a, to be a self defeating strategy. If it, if it is a strategy, I suspect it's somewhat accidental. And I want to ask you a question about me, it, which has come in from Mike Fennick by email, and he's the question he, he wants to me to put to you is, what is your advice to ensure the yes movement remain 100% focused on independence and remain united despite the many events which are unfolding? I don't know what advice I dare give them. Um, uh, as you've noticed, uh, I like to write. I like to, especially the essay form, you know, which is a long form, because I can give it time to think it through and look at the flaws and the weaknesses. Um, I'm not a pundit who has an instant opinion on everything. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. All I know is that if the SNP gets us to a state where we have the vote once more, everyone will unite automatically. Yeah. But time is critically short because Boris and his gang, including his underboss Cummings and the DUP, have worked out um, uh, a carefully uh, worded strategy to uh, take whatever teeth remain in Holyrood in our parliament to remove them yeah. and return it to what they said it was in the first place, you know, a sort of local council talking shop, um, um, and probably impose some kind of federalism. Um, and I used to think uh, that... Salmon offered a kind of federalism. I mean, uh, it was called separatism. That, it was depicted by our opponents, you know, as um, uh, isolationism. Yeah. And us wanting to separate from uh, Albion uh, and, all, and its power. But uh, there was very little in there except in Salmon's uh, prospectus, except we kept, we keep all the money that we earn. We decide it will be spent. We have our own foreign policy. What luxury that would be. Um, but the borders stay open, trade stays open, and we don't secede because we keep the royal family. I yeah. know that in time to come that might change. There are enough Republicans in Scotland who uh, dislike that. Um, but uh, I never thought Salmon was trying to shut down Scotland or remove it, you know, and push it out to the North Sea like Iceland somewhere. Yeah. He was trying. He was trying to say, "Look, we can carry on as we are, except we really don't want you interfering in our politics." I mean, when Gordon Brown, I'm, I'm diverging here. Uh, Apologise to your question. Uh, when Gordon Brown was prime minister, he was loathed. He was loathed by his English contemporaries down there. Uh, same as uh, George Galloway, you know, who's coming back here to tell the Scots to love these people who loathe us. <laughs> uh, so. Um, and uh, Gordon Brown was so uh, embarrassed about us, he refused to ever visit the Holyrood 
uh, parliament. He never ever has crossed its threshold. So uh, I think when the time comes, what we're doing now, this debate, which will get worse, by the way, the longer it takes for yeah. us to reach the point where uh, we can say, no, we are uh, reinstating self-determination, like hundreds of other countries. We're not going to hate you. You know, there are 350,000 and more English people living happily and working here in Scotland. So please, you know, it's nothing to do with disliking English or Polish or the Chinese. I mean, uh, the, the huge Italian contingency that's contributed so much to Scotland. Exactly. Uh, it's about civil and constitutional rights. <laughs> and even when Alex Salmond was running the referendum debate, there were moments where I felt he had too much emphasis on independence for the reason that I've just said, because it allowed our opponents to portray that as uh, separatism, you know, isolationism. Well, England has just uh, told Europe where to go. Who's the isolationist now? <laughs> Which sort of brings me on to a point that several people have raised. <clears throat> uh, what are your thoughts on the new independence polls, I guess uh, JD is referring on YouTube to the ones that were published today, which... Uh, it's just the 55%. Yeah, 54, 55% uh, yes, and 45%, I think, roughly no. Uh, and do you think, Jay is asking, uh, the, the Westminster government will continue to ignore these polls as they continue to rise? He's assuming, he's rather assuming the polls will actually get better and better, but even if they stay at their present level, what, what's your view? I think if Boris gave in, um, he would be dragged out by the uh, hair on his head and dumped into the Thames if he agreed to a referendum. Um, he's uh, pitched his tent next to Nigel Farage. Uh, the Tory party has absorbed those neo-fascist ideologies, the, the Farage creed, um, uh, the Tory party cares nothing for democracy, try to prorogue its own parliament. It wants its parliament back as its own. Um, I, uh, I'm the guy, you know, that put um, a bet in William Hills on us winning the referendum, even as I knew while handing over the money, which I would have split between my daughters, that we would lose it. And we would lose it because we have been colonized for over 300 years. Everything, our culture, our economy, uh, our ways of life, our traditions, our attitude. As I said earlier, you know, if we don't sound and look like uh, London, then... And by the way, the north of England has the same problem. Mm. They, they complain as well. Yeah. That's been going on for at least 150, 200 years you know, the writers in those days noticed that uh, people who traditionally worked on the land were losing their jobs, were losing um, their farm, and were being absorbed into London, this great new metropolis. Yeah. Uh, and George Orwell spotted it and wrote, it about, wrote about it. Uh, so there's nothing new in that. Um, I don't know if that's answered the question. I've probably gone too generalised. but Well, here's, here's, yeah, I think it has, in fact. Uh, but no doubt Jay will come back and tell us if he needs some more information. Um, he, Anne on Facebook is saying, it's a question about social policy now, uh, not about, necessarily about the Constitution. She said, should we have everyone retiring at 60 if we get independence? Uh, as I've had to work till 66 now, and I feel my body has worked so hard in hospitals, I'm just not fit to enjoy my retirement. <laughs> that would create jobs as well, surely. What's your view? It would. Yes, it would. I mean, uh, Scotland's one of the few countries that's got masses of arable land fit to be developed. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, after the clearances, um, those that didn't go to Canada or Australia uh, were filed on top of each other in tenements in Glasgow. When, uh, uh, you know, the Duke of Hamilton had all the nice green luscious ground around, around Glasgow. <laughs> Um, and Edinburgh's the Duke of Buclew that owns the, the best land around the city. Um, 
So I think that's a rather good idea, that and lots of uh, other holidays and a four-day week. I've, I've always thought that. And uh, as long as the young people are prepared to look after we elderly, <laughs> uh, you know, like the Japanese do, and don't yeah. send us off to uh, these privatised care homes where you get the coronavirus uh, <laughs> as well as uh, watery custard on your cake. Let me, let me share it. Thank you for that. Let me share a couple of thoughts from various fans who, who've written in. Uh, Lynn Woods, is, she says, I'm in remission and I'm, I'm sending empathy and I guess sympathy as well. Uh, Alba Dave on Facebook says, Gareth, we are all devastated uh, to know that we won't be graced with your grumpy self on Twitter. <laughs> it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> he, he says, my question is this. I, I, have you thought about trying to rejoin the SNP? No. No. I wouldn't do that. Um, I, I wasn't a member when I was thrown out. If that, if that, you weren't a member? No, I wasn't, no. So I wrote this. Um, uh, the guy who made that uh, stupendous blunder, Angus McLeod, the National Secretary, um, uh, a chap who um, obviously shows great strength of character, sufficient not to write and apologise, um, uh, didn't seem to realise it. But I wrote, they didn't know who I was, you know, when the furore broke. He had no idea who I was. Nobody had, in the party had, which was, was terribly depressing. It was more depressing than being accused of something I'd never done. Uh, and if any of you are watching wonders what I'm talking about, um, I should say I was accused of being anti-Semitic. Uh, a difficult thing, since half the family are Irish and the other half are Jewish. Um, I've got a Beverly, a Michael, a David, um, um, uh, a Jaime. Uh, I think I've got everything except a Shlomo in my family. And when I was younger, um, the rabbis used to visit me because um, they thought I'd make a good rabbi and the priest, the local priest used to visit and stare at me for ages to, to my guardian, uh, uh, no, 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 the boy, that boy looks as though he's just made, he's made for the Catholic Church. In fact, my wife has said that, especially when she gets really annoyed with me, God, you could have been a priest, get out of my way, you know, <laughs> you should have been a priest. So, um, I don't know what I'm talking about here, but I'm just trying to tell you that uh, uh, all my life I've deferred to other people. Uh, there's something in me that made me do it. I've never psychoanalyzed myself. I don't have that ego. Yeah. Uh, Scott, most well, Scots are practical people. I like to do things. I like to build things. And being half Italian, I'll build anything. <laughs> the Romans <laughs> built, <laughs> built, whatever they went, they built things. I mean, my house is on Roman archaeological ground, 10 feet away where the Roman garrison, the 2000 Roman garrison used to sit, you know, in Cramond in Edinburgh. And I'm very close to J.K. Rowling, just down the road. Oh, my word. How about that for one up and shit? Except I call her J.K. Rowling in it. I'm, I'm trying to picture this scene <clears throat> 2000 odd years ago. <laughs> uh, these. Romans in Cramond, it's hard to see that as a plum assignment somehow. I mean, no disrespect to Cramond, I love the place dearly. Oh, no, you're right, you're right. They found the, the Romans used to have little postcards made of wood, and uh, alongside Adrian's Wall and in the, um, the Roman uh, grounds near me, they found them. Uh, and it looks like black dots until you put them under um, uh, some sort of radio microscope. And then suddenly up comes the Italian writing and it says things like, oh, Mama, I want to go home. It's so cold here. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely correct. And I've been finding bits of pottery and bits of glass. Uh, I had to build up. Uh, it's, the house is on a promontory and I had to build up one side because it's a slope. Um, uh, uh, the damn land is worthless, you know, when it's lying on its side. And so uh, <laughs> I had to build that flat. But in the doing, I found all these old uh, bits of broken pottery. And you know, when you go into London and uh, uh, the beautiful, you know, the, the verdant parts of England start disappearing and suddenly get high embankments and the, the oiks and the schemes um, have been thrown their mattresses and their uh, dud fridges 
over the fence onto the railway embankment. Well, that's what these Romans did here. They threw, when they really broke, they threw it down the slope. And I've been digging it up ever since and cursing them. Uh, I was a bit worried just in case I found more than that, you know, some beautiful bathhouse with a terrazzo and stuff. Yeah. Still intact, uh, or a skeleton, something yeah. like that. And in which case, the council would have sent them the archaeological department and charged me 5000 a month to pay their diggers, and I couldn't build the house. I read somewhere that uh, most of the Roman uh, soldiery that uh, it's manned the uh, Antonine's Wall and uh, perhaps yeah. Hadrian's Wall too, well, not actually from Rome, but from the Roman provinces. I mean, other parts of Italy, Spain, uh, North Africa, Yes. I mean, that must have been a bit of a shock to the system in terms of climate difference you know, to move from <laughs> North Africa to, to the Antonines Wall. Anyway, that's, that, I, I made that's a documentary it. on the Italian prisoners who built the chapel up in Orkney. Oh, right. And I found one of the last living guards and I said, look, we'll do a scene where you walk along the beach and you recount your time with the prisoners. And um, it was a retired dentist, a lovely man, and he had a pipe and uh, he walked along, and the you know, cameraman and I were backing and listening to him. And he was thinking, well, he said it was, it was freezing cold in the winter as we had to break these giant rocks. And uh, Churchill told us to get them out there into the sea to build these barricades against the, you know, the U boats, the German U boats coming through. And he said, I was away from my family and we were never fed. And I said, whoa, 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 cut, cut, cut. And I sort of ambled up to him. <laughs> they said, uh, uh, you're doing fine, fine, but just forgive me for saying this. I said, um, was it not the Italians doing all that work? You just had to have a rifle over your shoulder and, you know, and, and supervise them. And he took a long think and a puff out his pipe. And as the smoke went up, he gave a wonderful Scottish compliment. I will. I'll give them half of it. <laughs> <laughs> we Scots are not famous for our compliments. I learned that when I went to... to um, Los Angeles and Hollywood. Mr. Wydell, please, it's, it's Wardell, but just call me Gareth. Gareth, we just love your voice and accent. And you said, like, who the hell is she talking to? You know, because you've had an inferiority complex about your Scottish accent all your life, which you've been trying to flatten. So you sound uh, English and educated and gone to a good school with a good tie. Incidentally, I don't even know the suit, never mind the tie. I think I've got a black one for funerals, which I might have to wear myself quite soon. So, in, in addition to documentaries, that was which you about, about, was right? Documentaries. Carry you, on. You 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 shot the Proclaimers' first video. Is that right? I did. Yeah. They they from America. Guys, yeah. I, re, I, I refused their um, agent um, when he uh, first wrote. I'd uh, read it. I think I'd made by that point. Um, the political thriller. I hadn't made the film um, that I made in Scotland. And I pompously wrote back and said, I don't do videos. I do, I do major dramas. Uh, and then he sent me a tape. He said, please, 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 please listen to this. And I heard this amazing, these amazing, raw, uncompromising voices coming out, you know. Uh, you go. And I thought, uh, any writers, any lyricists who can get metal in their lyrics. I'm going, to, I'm going to invite them in and they're going to do their video. And I got to number two, but I did tell them that um, the London boys would take over uh, and uh, that, that work would stay in Scotland and that's exactly what happened. As soon as I got anywhere in making films in Scotland, uh, the London film, uh, the English Film industry. We Scots don't have one. We we have a, a community of filmmakers, uh, very talented ones, and the SNP have given us a, a four wall studio and leaf at last to use. Uh, but uh, uh, it, 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 the money is in London, and as soon as I uh, achieved anything, they shut down the funds. But funnily enough, just before I went to America. Uh, one of the biggest producers came to me to ask for a loan of money for his film. So I just sat there and looked at him and said, do I really look as stupid as you think I 
<laughs> How many times did I come to you, you know? And I had my um, investment accountant with me grabbing my hand and don't alienate this chap, don't alienate him. And I said, no, why, why should we invest in him when he's refused every single project? And the guy took a script on Glencoe to one of the biggest producers in London with some of the biggest names attached to it. Uh, Alec Guinness, just before he died, uh, Dubai, I, I, would, I would give my right arm to play in this script. You tell them I'm involved. And the producer said, who the hell wants to see a Scottish costume drama? Uh, that was one, one year before Braveheart. Yeah. You know nothing. And, it, you know, it's understandable. It's their culture. Why should they not develop and film and adapt their own culture? Why should they not make uh, Pride and Prejudice for the 13th time? Um, that's entirely up to them. I just object that they block our culture and we have got no um, way to get it seen in cinemas and the BBC can allow us to transmit it. We are treated as a, a province. Yeah. Um. Another question. Oh, no, another one. Yeah, they're, they're coming thick and fast here. And by the way, I apologise to the folks who didn't get their question answered tonight. I know we're coming almost to the end, but uh, we've tried to fit in as many questions as we possibly can. But my apologies if, if your question hasn't been asked. It's Robert Wilson on Facebook, and the question he's asking is this. Will Wales be independent sooner or later? They're too... I've always thought Wales is too close to London to get its independence quickly. They lost the Brexit vote, and uh, it was one of the universities, Aberystwyth, did analysis, and they found that the vote had been swayed by the incomers, yeah. not by the Welsh. The Welsh voted that they wanted to stay in the EU. So uh, they have a problem that they are geographically and economically and socially so close to London. Yeah. You know, we're much further away. Yeah. Um, and uh, we know when we're being ignored. Yeah. Here's a, here's a thanks for that. Here's a, here's a question that came in by email earlier. Uh, it's from John Brown. Uh, and he calls himself Brun, Brunpot. Oh, he yeah. Said, <laughs> he, said, well, he says, one of my favorite movie genre is the spaghetti westerns, you no know, Clint Eastwood's, Sergio Leone, etc. He wants to know what your favourite film genre is and why. Well, uh, I love the spaghetti westerns. Um, when a student, I went out after seeing um, Clint Eastwood and bought a poncho and I staggered <laughs> around Glasgow and Byers Road in this point. Ah, you can laugh. Yeah, I'm quite eccentric, really. Did you have the little the cigar? I had, yeah. I hate smoking, but I made sure the long thing <laughs> route there. Yeah, I met Clint Eastwood, um, uh, which I must write about, um, and it was an outdoors event, and uh, I made him laugh by telling him that um, uh, Mel Gibson's uh, Wallace was the only man in Scotland who owned a razor, uh, and then we walked to this big table where the buffet, the, <laughs> the buffet had been laid out. Um, and it was all chopped green and red and brown lettuces, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, he was holding his plate and I heard him say to me, uh, this smell looks like uh, Jackson Pollock. That was... So I've got, I've got one story with, with him. Um, the political thriller. I, I don't do academic uh, thesis. I write screenplays or I... I Doctor uh, screenplays that are in bad health that are sent to me. And that's what I'm doing now in my dotage. And um, the political thriller has, if written by a good writer, yeah. uh, has tremendous power uh, in illustrating uh, what's happening around us, probably more so than buying a, 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 a factual book written by an academic. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did with Brond, um, which we set in Glasgow, uh, to show how Scotland's uh, politics are manipulated. Um, and it won an award in America for the best screenplay uh, and was not uh, subtitled. Yeah. A local Hero was subtitled. 
Staten Islands, uh, but uh, Braun was not, and that was a, a full Glaswegian uh, uh, accent. How do people get to see Braun if they want this? People I, want to see Braun. Uh, I don't have a copy. Um, uh, when I, uh, the, I believe I'm told it's on YouTube. Um, there, but I'm not sure. I think I saw a bit of it, and it, the, the the quality looked poor. Yeah, it was a Channel Four production. My film yeah. after that about five unemployed guys <laughs> who are out of work one year before Train Spotting. See, my instincts are good. Um, the BFI, the British Film Institute, owned it, and I, I think they filed it away under the I don't know, I don't know what category they filed yeah. it. Uh, there's nothing whimsical about it, but it was political as well. Um, unfortunately, you'll not see anything made that's got any kind of political reference reference about anything in Scotland, yeah. not by any of the television companies and most certainly not by any um, film production company. And the wonderful little company in Glasgow that made uh, Outlaw King, yeah. it's American money, and the, the talented director had uh, already made... Uh, a superb film uh, in the American genre um, and was given this chance so to make a Scottish epic, uh, which I enjoyed uh, tremendously, as I did Braveheart. Yeah. I, absolutely, I, love, I mean, I love those films. And they just catch, the, you know, they catch your spirit. Same as any Englishman would love to see a film about Lord Nelson, exactly the same emotion. So coming, going back to... Uh your activities on social media. Uh, you've, got, you've, got, you've got an essay site that attracts 50,000 readers a month worldwide. Is that uh, it? Yeah, when add them all up, yeah. Maybe it's the same few, you know, they're just, they just keep... I can't tell. There was, there was one, I had a look, you know, you look at your analytics, and one came in from Nepal, and I found myself writing, hey, I've just seen <laughs> somebody is reading my work from me. Paul, who the hell is that? And up on the screen popped this photograph of a guy, a little guy about, I would say 11 or 12, in a yurt in Nepal with his open <laughs> computer laptop in front of him saying, it's me, Garris, it's me. <laughs> and I, I wanted to kiss the guy. I said, oh, great to know. Please keep writing in. So, yeah, but I've got to keep the quality of writing high. I? Yeah. The, the more people watch, the, the greater the responsibility. And I don't want to get into the, into the habit where you just write for uh, notoriety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I write because I hear someone has said something and it sparks something in my head. And I think, well, that's what people are thinking. Let me, let me write this out to see if it makes any sense. And if it does, I'll put it on. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I hope it keeps coming. And you've got uh, your Twitter site has an average of 2.5 million readers a month. Is that I right? Know. It's unbelievable. And I don't make a penny from any of these things. <laughs> I don't have a fun, nothing. This is the last look. I'm still in my last shirt. And yeah. I even put the buttons on it myself. Come on, you're, you're, you're preaching to the <laughs> choir. I, I don't get, we don't get a penny for this either. This is, this is done that. <laughs> As you do, it's out of love. Uh, and I have to get my wife to cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that's, why, that's why we do it. I mean, the BBC is sitting there on top of 31, 32 million pounds. And I like to think in many respects in terms of the quality of the guests, we do just as well as they do on a, a mere pittance. Uh, look, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, I wish you all the very best. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm honoured that you should ask me because I, I, I don't particularly think um, uh, uh, any more than I'm just a guy who writes in, uh, interesting blogs with uh, well-honed phrases. Uh, There's precious few around, let me tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and I, can I say to everyone watching and listening, uh, obviously a big thanks to Gareth and a big thanks to all of you for watching tonight. I mean, we really do appreciate it and we do appreciate all your questions. I'm sorry if your question didn't get asked. We tried to fit in as many as we could. Uh, again, we have a formidable list of guests coming. 
I mean, Michael Kelly is up next week. Michael Gray, sorry, uh, of Scotia joins us next week. And he'll be talking about his life and his career, as well as his views on Scotland's future. So please don't miss the show. Join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for The Nation Talks to Michael Gray. Oh, and yes, please do look out for Dr. Elliot Bulmer's Constitution column this weekend uh, in the Sunday National. And very importantly, please support Indie Live and Indie Live Radio. Uh, these guys do a phenomenal job. If you haven't accessed their material, please do so. Uh, and if you'd like to show tonight, please, uh, if you can find some money, do send them something as a contribution. Uh, and thank you again, and a very good night. Join us next Wednesday, when we'll look forward to seeing you again. And remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Good night, all. Thanks, Gareth. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present music and musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The musings, well, they're thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, I'm Fiona from Clackman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? It goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio. Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. No Westminster. No Westminster. Come on. No Westminster. Not for me.
Hi there, I'm, I'm Clough. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing our programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a standby. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.